good evening, Doctor. Okay, so hi, good evening. Uh, so everyone, welcome to our case by case basics series on orthopedics. Uh, my name is uh, Chan Chi Ken, fourth year UM medical student. Oh yeah. And, uh, Okay, yep, and uh, this is my partner, uh, Mr. Lu Qingyuan. Uh, yeah, hi. Aaron, you want to yep, you want to introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Aaron, so uh, I'm also a fourth-year medical student. Both of us are fourth-year medical students, and um, we will be your moderator for today. Yes, that's right. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, just a quick introduction uh, of our speaker for today, Dr. Chung Wing Hong. Uh, Dr. Chung Wing Hong serves as a lecturer in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, North Sarau, University of Malaya, and is a spine surgeon in the University of Malaya Medical Center. He specializes in spinal surgeries for patients with spinal deformities, such as scoliosis, and also minimally invasive spinal surgery and degenerative spine diseases. So a little bit about Dr. Chung's history. Uh, Dr. Chung obtained his medical degree in uh, MD from the University Science Malaysia and was awarded the Dean's List Award in 2009. He also served in Hospital Kulim and Hospital Sultana Bahia, Alosta. Due to his uh, dedication to patients' care, he was awarded the Excellent Service Award in 2012. He attained his Masters of Orthopedic Surgery from the University of Malaya in 2017 at the top of his class and was awarded the Best Master's Student Award in University of Malaya. He's also an active researcher, particularly in the field of scoliosis and minimally invasive spinal surgery, and has won numerous awards internationally for his research. Uh, his work is further recognized through his participation in multiple associations such as the Malaysian Spine Society and Asia Pacific Spine Society, in addition to his role as a peer reviewer in numerous journals, both locally and internationally. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Chung Wing Hong. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Chan, for your introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone has enjoyed your dinner already. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah, nice to meet you all. All right, I hope that this session will actually um, shed some light and and give some input and uh, uh, insight to all the medical students over here. Uh, I was told that uh, um, it's not only fourth year, right? It's from first year, second, third, fourth, and final years, right? Yeah, so I hope that uh, this session will actually uh, give you some insight and extra information and knowledge uh, and hope that you can gain uh something from this session okay thank you all right so um before we start so um we there's a few ground rules and reminder for all the participants so firstly uh, as you can see the session is recorded um secondly um please keep your microphones muted unless you're prompted to unmute it uh, if let's say you have any questions or queries next um the slides will be given after the feedback form for the session is filled in um, if you have any questions, please type it in the chat box and we will attend to them during our Q&A session. And next, um, feel free to participate actively in our discussion as well. All right, so without further ado, we shall start with our first case. Okay, uh, thank you, Aaron. So right now, I, I will share uh, my screen, ladies and gentlemen. So can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Yes, I'll put it in slideshow mode. OK, everyone can see the screen. Uh, doctor, OK, we can see that we can proceed. Yes. All right, very good. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, this is the case by case basics for orthopedics, specifically for spine. All right, with Dr. Chung Wing Hong uh, and also uh, with us moderators, Chan Chi Ken and Lu Ching Yuan. So on to our first case. All right, so case one, a 52-year-old Malay lady. Okay, we have a 52-year-old Malay lady with diabetes mellitus, works as an administrator in the education ministry. All right, so she has, uh, she presented with bilateral lower limb weakness for one day and is progressively worsening. So before we proceed, like, what further questions would we want to ask? So uh, Aaron, you got any ideas of what questions you want to ask? Hmm, um, probably since the patient actually complained of um, bilateral lower limb, uh, lower limb weakness, right? And uh, 
saying that um, we also actually we are talking about spine here per se. So of course we need to ask about any pain. Lah. OK, so generally whether there's any um, pain, lower limb pain as well, or can extend it up to the hip pain, any um, back pain as well. Yeah. OK, right. So doctor, anything you want to add, uh, doctor? OK, hi. Yeah, so um, just, an in, just an overview, um, there are actually not many symptoms in spine uh, history per se. All right? So in general, there are basically five most important symptoms. All right? Number one is pain. Okay, it could be back pain, all right? uh, but which area is the back pain, whether it's in the uh, uh, neck, all right? whether it's in the upper thoracic, mid thoracic, lower thoracic, lumbar, lumbar sacral, all right, or sacrum, all right. Uh, whether the pain is axial or paravertebral, that is very important. Okay, on top of that, whether it is just a mechanical back pain or this is an organic back pain. So you should ask whether there's any night uh, or, or rest pain, all right. This is a very important red flag. Okay, in with regards to mechanical back pain, you should ask whether there's any instability, all right, whether the patient is able to uh, perform her daily activities, all right, whether the patient can uh, sit up from lying position or stand up from sitting position and so on. Okay, that is for back pain. Okay, the second most important, uh, second not to say most important, second symptom uh, with regards to spine is whether there's any limb pain. It could be upper limb or lower limb, all right, whether it's one side or bilateral. And if it is possible, you should ask uh, 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 whether the pain follows any uh, specific dermatome, whether it follows L4, L5, or S1, whether it is unilateral or bilateral, okay, that is very important, okay. Aggravating factors are very important and relieving factor as well, okay. So claudication will fall under this one as well. So if the patient tells you that uh, after walking for some period of time, patient has got buttock pain or calf pain or thigh pain, but they are not very sure where, is that, where exactly the pain. They will tell you usually the whole calf is painful or it, they will tell you discomfort uh, or numb right, after walking for some time. So that is claudication. Okay, the, third, the third history that you need to ask is whether there's any weakness in which this patient has. All right. So with regards to weakness, again, whether this is a unilateral a monoplasia, a one limb, whether it's left uh, upper limb, right upper limb, left lower limb, or right lower limb, okay, or whether it is bilateral lower limb. When it is bilateral lower limb, it is also known as paraplegia, okay? All right, so this paraplegia, because why is this so important is because this is one of the uh, uh, important um, um, a symptom, okay, to determine the level. Where is the level? All right. So then, if the patient has got paraplegia, you must ask whether the upper limb is normal or not. If the patient also tell you that the upper limbs, both upper limbs are not, uh, are weaker as well. So this patient has having tetra. It's not para only. All right. So the whole, the whole uh, uh, scenario is different. Okay, because sometimes patient may just tell you the most significant. Uh, uh, symptom to him, all right? But then they say that I upper limb a bit only, then never mind, no need to tell doctor, but you must ask, okay? All right, so the next uh, thing regarding the, uh, because why is it so important is that if it is tetraplegia, 99.9%, .9 it has to be from cervical, okay? Because very difficult uh, 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 a brain pathology can cause tetraplegia only, okay? Because if the brain pathology causes tetraplegia, the patient has to be, you know, poor GCS, okay? Uh, patient may have speech problems, okay? Because there is no single pathology, uh, there's no single uh, area in the brain that can cause tetraplegia without causing all this uh, uh, GCS and uh, speech problem, all right? Am I right? Chan, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. As far it. as I, as far yeah. as I, as far as I remember, as and as far as I know, because if you have to cause uh, 
all four limbs, right? It has to be from both uh, uh, motor, uh, motor cortex, both sides. And it involves the whole area, area four. And uh, what is the pathology? It's from direct, um, direct injury, uh, brain edema, but that will also cause GCS, poor GCS and speech problem. All right. Uh, due to vessel, it's very difficult because um, the uh, outer part of the uh, area four, the, the one that supply your limb and the facial, that is by MCA. All right. But inside is by, uh, which one? Inside is by ACA, anterior cerebral uh, artery. All right. So it's very difficult to have two main big vessels uh, causing uh, 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 this, uh, this uh, problem. All right. So if it's paraplegia, it is anything below cervical up to the conus. So this is a very important uh, history. Okay. So um, of course, the uh, chronicity is very important. Like this patient is one day, it is very emergency. Okay. Any neurological deficit is a red flag. Okay. Whether it's acute or chronic, you just treat it as a red flag because if you were the uh, doctor in the KK or in uh, uh, wherever, uh, you can't treat weakness. Lah. You have to refer to, you know, to the, uh, uh, the uh, appropriate uh, field, the respective field, respective doctor. Okay, so the chronicity, whether it's one day or one month, it is very important because it determines the urgency of the situation. If it is one day, it's very urgent. One hour is very urgent. But it's already one month or, or three months, then it is not so urgent. That is the, chronic, the chronicity. Uh, next is that because this patient only happens one day. Say, for example, if you see a patient with uh, about probably about a week uh, or two weeks history, you must ask the uh, progression of the neurology. Okay, um, when the patient starts to have weakness, okay, how how um, how does it progress? So you must ask. Okay, initially, uh, patient is able to walk. But uh, he feels weak, but still able to walk. All right, he's still able to climb the stairs. All right, then later on, he has difficulty climbing up the stairs. He can only walk on flat ground, not even uneven surface. All right, then after that, it progresses further. The patient needs walking aids to help him to walk. Whether it is a walking stick, or it progresses further, he needs a a a, a walking frame. Okay. Then after that, patient cannot walk, can't stand as well. All right, patient is wheelchair bound. Okay, so you have to um, determine the uh, progression. All right, or patient wheelchair bound after that cannot move the lower limbs, lower limb at, uh, at all. Okay, so uh, this is the progression that you must ask. Okay, the next uh, history, a symptom that you have to uh, ask is numbness. Where is the numbness? In this patient, the level of numbness is very, very important in this patient because this patient has paraplegia, all right? And like I said just now, the level of injury can be from below cervical down to the conus, and it is a very long area, okay? So why is this so important? Because the assessment or the uh, determination of the uh, neurological level or sensory level, or determination identification of the lesion, okay, the localization of the lesion, should be from clinical, not from imaging. You cannot do a whole spine MRI for every single patient to find the lesion. All right, even though if you are able, say for example, like your hospital is very rich. Every single patient can do a whole spine MRI. Okay, this patient might have multiple pathology. Say, for example, uh, if uh, it is a degenerative cause, all right. Uh, say, for example, not this case, uh, another case. Right? Say, for example, it is um, degenerative lumbar disease. Okay, patient may have stenosis, stenosis at L3, 4, L4, 5, and L5, S1 level. Which level are you going to operate? Because if you are able to just do a, a single level surgery, the surgery is much more uh, easy, it's easier 
and less risk, you reduce, you reduce the surgical risk rather than doing a three level decompression. Okay, and then you may have to uh, instrument with, uh, 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 you have to uh, uh, insert screws, all right, and all that, okay, because it's not stable anymore, right? So the identification or the localization of the level should be from clinical. So you have to ask the patient, okay, or probably in this case, if it is a tumor, the patient may have multiple spine metastasis with multiple uh, uh, spinal uh, canal stenosis. And then which level causes the problem? Right, so yes, of course you can see the MRI, whether uh, that level has got spinal cord edema, uh, whether the compression is more severe, all right, but still, the most important thing is that you, we as we as doctors, we must treat the patient's problem, not the MRI. If the patient tell you that uh, the upper limb is uh, not normal, it is still not normal. You cannot disregard aya, no la, okay? Because you you think that your neurological examination when you perform a neurology examination is normal, so. So, so, so it is still from clinical. So in this patient, you must ask, where is the sensory level? You ask them, okay, uh, since uh, from, uh, starting from which area or which level is numb? Patient tell you both lower limbs are numb. Okay, then you ask any trunk numbness or not. And ask the patient to point to you. Where is the numbness, uh, where does the numbness start? And where is the normal area? All right, so you must ask the, so from history, you already determine the level then you can supplement with your sensory examination in your physical examination. The last, uh, the, uh, last symptom you have to ask is bowel and urine, urinary symptoms, whether there's any incontinence, all right? And you have to understand, uh, uh, the bowel and urine symptoms in spine is a spectrum. Even though if you have cauda equina or what, it's a spectrum. The patient will not, it's not zero or one. The patient will not come to you and tell you, or oh, I have a full-blown uh, incontinence, all right? So must, initially, patient may have just urgency, okay? Increase on frequency, and they cannot tahan, they cannot control. Every time they feel that they want to urinate, they have to go to toilet, all right? Or probably if they cannot go to toilet uh, at, um, uh, immediately, maybe they have some dribbling. The panties are wet, all right? So all these are, are the, 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 the symptoms you must... Uh, uh, you must ask. Then patient may have retention. They cannot pass urine or pass motion. Then only full-blown uh, incontinence. All right. So these are the five important history that you must ask in your uh, spine history. Lah. All right. Yep. I'm done. <laughs> Back to you, Chan. Okay. Thank you, doctor. So just to summarize, uh, so first symptom that we need to ask is uh, any back pain. Okay. And then second symptom is any limb pain. Then third one is uh, weakness. Fourth is numbness. And then fifth is bowel and bladder symptoms. Yeah, okay. All right. So, okay. So now we have the questions that we want to ask. So we ask the patient, all right? We move on to the... But yeah, but before we move on, right? We want to... There's this thing that spine surgeons always talk about which are the red flag symptoms. And they always, and what we always found out in the, when we are taking our history is that this, the spine surgeons always ask us, you must rule out red flag symptoms. So doctor, what are uh, these so-called red flag symptoms actually? Yeah, it's something emergency, la. red flags. Ma. Not, like, uh. not, not white flag. Ah. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's yeah, a white so, flag uh, issue, yeah. So red flags means that something that you have to pay attention to, it is emergency, all right? Yeah, so red flags, uh, you can either divide into, uh, that means that it is something that you have to pay attention to. You cannot just um, uh, send the patient back, right? You have to uh, perform further uh, investigation to look for the uh, problem, to find out the problem, all right? So that means that you have to pay attention. Yeah, so, uh, the uh, red flags, for example, um, the age group, extreme age group, too young or too old. Okay, too young, you know, less than 10 years old, they won't tell you they have back pain. Nah. All right, kids wear your back pain one. 
Oh, yeah, you got the slide here already. So yeah, probably I can just run through. Lah. Too young or too old. I think 55 still okay. I think probably anything more than 80, all right? Because elderly back pain, you must rule out whether there's any tumor. Okay, trauma is, um, itself is a red flag, so you must rule out fracture or dislocation. Okay, thoracic back pain here. Okay, most of the time, our back pain, which is due to muscular strain, is over the lower lumbar or uh, neck, side, and shoulders. Okay, very seldom you have mid thoracic back pain. And if it is axial, that means at the center, axial. Mid thoracic back pain itself is a red flag because it could be due to uh, tumor, it could be due to infection. All right, because most common muscular strain is over lower lumbar or over the uh, dimple of venous, ESIS there, because that is where your uh, uh, ligaments and muscles are attached to. History of malignancy, yeah, this one, uh, logic law, right? You have to ask for, uh, you must, uh, you must uh, rule out uh, 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 tumor or spine mass in this patient. Prolonged steroid use, high risk of infection or osteoporosis, all right? Prolonged steroid use. So, uh, patients like asthma, glomerulonephritis, inflammatory uh, diseases, SLE, uh, what else? Uh? Uh, yeah, so these are the patients' uh, diseases that you must ask. Well, whether that's, if the patient tells you that I'm an uh, asthmatic patient, uh, then you must ask, is there any uh, history of prolonged steroid usage? Okay. Uh, drug abuse, immunosuppression, HIV, uh, high risk of infection. Constitutional symptoms like night sweat, uh, rest pain, night pain, loss of weight, loss of appetite. This also point towards chronic infection and tumor. A uh, fever, very seldom, even though in discitis patient, very seldom you have fever. Only in septic patient, right? Because discitis itself, it is not a very acute uh, infection. So normally patient will not present with fever. So bear in mind, fever is not uh, how to say, uh, it's not a distinctive feature of uh, discitis. Meaning that if patient has no fever, then you say, oh, this is not discitis. This is wrong. All right, patient can still have discitis. Okay. Uh, progressive neurological symptoms. Yeah, I would say that any neurological symptoms is a reflect. If progressive, even worse. All right, including cordon equina syndrome, yes. ESRF on dialysis, uh, end stage renal failure on dialysis, any patient who is end-stage renal failure, if it is on dialysis, plus dialysis, presented with back pain, you must rule out infection, spine infection, until proven otherwise. Okay, again, uh, any patient who is an end-stage renal failure on dialysis, with or without dialysis, lah, all right? If you've got dialysis, even higher risk, okay? Presented with back pain, you must rule out discitis, spondylodiscitis, spine infection. Okay, understand? Uh? This, is, this is very important. Okay, again, uh, <laughs> this is where you have to stress three times according to my, to my, uh, <laughs> according to my teacher. Okay, important things you must stress three times. Any patient with end-stage renal failure on dialysis presented with back pain, it is spondylodiscitis or spine infection until proven otherwise. Again, ah, uh, okay, enough lah. All right, okay. Very important uh, because these patients are immunosuppressive, immunocompromised. So you must rule out spine infection. Okay, all right. Rest pain and night pain, uh, logic law. Huh? So you have to ask uh, whether there's any infection or tumor. Osteoporosis itself is also a reflex. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we got a very comprehensive idea on what all these red flags uh, mean. All right. So next one. Okay. So now we look at the entire history la, for this patient. All right. So, all right. So first of all, she has bilateral worsening of the lower limbs. Okay. Uh, uh, bilateral worsening of lower limb weakness. Okay. For one day. All right. So this lower limb weakness. Okay. So we must ask, where is the worst? Uh, so she said the worst one is on the left thigh. All right. So it started, and then we want to ask the progression. It started in the morning. Okay, this weakness, 
And then later in the day, she's unable to stand. So early in the morning, she's able to stand. And after that, later in the day, she's unable to stand. So it's a very uh, aggressive, uh, very, the progression is very fast, okay? Until she has uh, debilitating symptoms, okay? So, and then, but of course, due to this weakness, she has no falls, okay? But we also must uh, take into account that this is a very acute case, okay? So, and then she also complained that there is sudden onset of mid-thoracic back pain for the past two days, all right, which radiates to the both lower limbs upon coughing, all right? She also said there's bilateral lower limb numbness for two days. So this lower limb numbness, it began on the plantar surface of the right foot and then progressed to the posterior part of the thigh and leg, okay? So if it's any other case, we might think that this is a, a S1 distribution, right, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, yeah, S1 distribution. So, and then it proceeded to involve the entire leg and the left leg as well. And she also noticed numbness extending to the umbilical level. So umbilical level. So I think this is also quite important. We would want to know, uh, we want to know uh, where is the sensory. So umbilical level. So umbilical level from here, we think that maybe that this is uh, maybe T10, okay, somewhere there. Otherwise, there's no settled anesthesia and no bowel or bladder incontinence. So maybe probably this is not a cauda equina syndrome. All right, and then no fever, no constitutional symptoms, no history of trauma or carrying heavy objects, and the systemic review is unremarkable. All right, so, uh, and then she has a past history of lower back pain in August 2020, but improved with physiotherapy, now resolved. Okay, so, yeah, so that's all for the history, all right? So, uh, Doctor, you got any comments on the history so far? Yeah, so far, very comprehensive. Yeah. Okay, good. Very happy. So now we, yeah, okay, very good. So now we move on to the physical examination. All right, so physical examination, basically, yeah, okay, this is not uh, the whole physical examination, but we want to start off with a few, uh, by telling the audience a few things. So there is tenderness at the lower thoracic region, okay, tenderness at the lower thoracic region. And in terms of the neurology, upper limb is normal, okay, upper limb is normal. So maybe it's not cervical, okay. So, and then lower limb, hip flexion, okay, so this, uh, this two slash two means right and left, lah. okay, right and left. Hip flexion two, uh, hip flexion, the power is two on both sides. Knee extension power, MRC grade four on both sides. Dorsi flexion, MRC grade four on both sides. Great toe extension, MRC grade four bilaterally. And plantar flexion, MRC grade five bilaterally. So from here, uh, we just want to uh, see lah, what further physical signs would we want to elicit? Okay, so uh, Aaron, you got any ideas of what physical signs, like if you are looking at this patient, so what would you try to do first? Um, okay, so since I'm, if let's say I'm actually looking at this patient, definitely I would do a complete um, lower limb neurological ex examination. Lah. So um, it will just, yeah, it will involve bone reflexes, power and sensory. So since um, power is given really, so um, just complete it by doing checking the tone um, reflexes. Reflexes will also include doing Babinski and clonus as well. Yeah, and also sensory uh, dermatomal distribution. Lah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. Chung, uh, any things that you want to add in regards to the physical examination? Um, yeah, so I, I agree with what Aaron said. Um, in this patient, because you have to, uh, whatever you, are, you you have to um, understand one thing is that um, history will tell you about seventy percent to eighty percent of the diagnosis. Physical examination about 20 to 20, ten to twenty percent, and investigation about ten percent. So whatever you're doing, you have to confirm your history. Your physical examination is to confirm your history. All right. So in this physical examination, from your history. What you have in summary is that it's a 50-year-old lady presented with acute neurological uh, deficit involving both lower limb, okay, bilateral lower limb weakness for one day associated with mid-thoracic back pain. Okay, so these two important history. So number one, I will check, I will uh, um, localize where is the uh, uh, back pain. Right? So you have to perform a spine palpation and the best is to perform spine palpation when the patient is lying prone. But in patient who has a lot of uh, pain, uh, if the spine is not stable, such as a fracture or a, uh, dislocation, 
then you wouldn't want to turn the patient up, right? So you can just lie the patient on lateral position. But the best position is on prone, okay? So you run your fingers or your thumb, okay, from uh, top to bottom and find out where is the tenderness, all right? So that is very important. Um, yeah, just now I forgot to mention one thing is that when a patient has got uh, thoracic back pain, you should ask whether there is any thoracic radicular pain. Because that itself also tells us the level. Say for some patients says that uh, there is a radicular pain coming from the back to the nipple level. All right, he showed to you, he showed like that, that this is T4. All right, so radicular pain can, thoracic radicular pain can tell the level. Okay, so coming back to the uh, physical examination, so I will perform a spine examination uh, looking for tenderness uh, to ascertain the level. That's number one. You can localize the level. Okay, one way. Second way, after you perform all the uh, power and all that, uh, power can actually, um, it can tell you the severity in this case, but it cannot tell you uh, the level because it's paraplegia, ma, it's from thoracic. Ma. Anything also can cause the similar, any level in the thoracic can also cause the similar presentation. All right? It's not like uh, uh, lumbar where you have, uh, say for example, you have uh, L5, red, uh, L5 weakness, great toe weakness, and then you say this is uh, L5, okay? But in this case, uh, any thoracic level will give the similar uh, presentation. So the power will, will actually tell you the severity rather than the level, okay? Uh, of course, you have to examine the tone because, again, you have to, uh, you have to uh, confirm your history. Ma. So tone, if say for example, if you, if you get hypertonia, which is very good, but a lot of times uh, in acute neurological deficit, a patient may not have uh, upper motor neuron signs. So your tone, reflexes, Babinski, Cronus, all may be negative. Or even hypotonia. It's some sort of like a spinal shock. All right? Okay, so don't be too, uh, you know, some, some students, they are a bit more, you say, hey, doctor, it's from the cord, how come there is no upper motor neuron signs? Uh, yes, theoretically, yes, it should have, but a lot of times uh, in spine, especially, there isn't, because I think it is too um, acute, all right? It is too acute, so patient may not have upper motor neuron signs. So then you examine the reflexes. Okay, a uh, 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 knee reflex, ankle reflex, Babinski, Cronus, like what Aaron said. Uh, then lastly, in my physical examination, for me, in this case, uh, the most important physical examination to, exam to, to elicit in this patient is sensory. Okay, because power already know, patient already tell you they, she cannot walk. So it's Franco C already, patient cannot walk. All right, it's severe. All right, so I just, when I do the power, it's just mainly for, uh, to ascertain the severity and also for documentation. Because I do not want to do a surgery, then after that, patient wake up, power is zero. So you do not know whether this is due to your surgery or even before the surgery, patient already deteriorate, right? Yeah, so for me, in this patient, localization is very important. So I will spend time in doing my sensory examination. So there is some, um, uh, a lot of times that um, the sensory may not be very clear cut, okay? Uh, for example, probably T11 is absent, T12 present but uh, reduced, uh, L1 may be slightly normal, L2 may be slightly reduced, okay? Then the, the student get confused whether which one is normal, which one is abnormal. All right, so always the proximal, if it is abnormal, no matter distal, got or don't have, all right, the proximal, it is still abnormal. Ma. You, cannot, you cannot disregard that, that, abnor that abnormal proximal uh, uh, level. You get what I mean? So in this, if, in this case, T11 is not normal, okay? Then you move up. Then of course, you do the whole lower limb first, right? If T11 is not normal, you must check T10, the proximal level whether it's normal or not, all right? You get what I mean? If T6 abnormal, you must check T5, 
and T4, you must confirm, okay, above than this, all are normal. So this level is my sensory level. Okay, you get what I mean? All right. Then, of course, lastly, uh, I will do a, a PR, lah, okay, to check a uh, few things. Number one is perianal sensation. Number two is anal tone. Number three is voluntary anal contraction. Number four is deep anal pressure or deep anal sensation. Okay, no need to check for bubble cavernosus reflexes because BCR is in spinal shock. Okay, and you want to know whether the if presence of spinal shock indicates cessation of the so presence of BCR indicates cessation of the spinal shock. All right, so you don't do BCR for every single patient. Okay, all right, yeah. Uh, then of course, because um, I still do not know whether this is infection, tumor, uh, trauma. All right, I do not know. Unlikely due to trauma because there's no history of a uh, fall trauma or uh, a heavy lifting. Uh, trauma, the one trauma that I'm saying is not fracture, it's not dislocation, it's acute disherniation. Okay, because acute disherniation can happen in thoracic, especially in a bit obese patient. Okay, uh, we still haven't ruled out whether there's any tumor or not. So besides in history, I'll ask about uh, the uh, primary organs uh, involvement. In the physical examination, I'll also check the primary organs. So then you have to ask yourself, what are the... Uh, organs that prone to spread uh, to the spine. Okay, so it's bone prone tumor like killer. La. So bone is uh, uh, breast, prone prostate, tumor, thyroid, like lung, killer, kidney, and you add on GI, la, colorectal. So these are the common organs that uh, are, are prone to spread to the spine in terms of spine metastasis. Okay. So that's all. All right. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Okay. So now, now that we know what we want to look for in the physical examination, all right. So, okay. So here is a more. Uh, here is the rest of the physical examination. Okay. So tenderness over the T8, T9 level. Okay. So lower limb neurological examination. The uh, the tone is reduced bilaterally. So we can call this a hypotonia. Uh, reflexes hyporeflexia on knee jerk and ankle reflex, but Babinski is upgrowing. So, doctor, from here, I actually got one question. La. So, from the tone and the reflexes, right, we, we see that this like, looks like hyporeflexia, hypotonia, looks like lower motor neuron lesion. But then suddenly, when we do Babinski, it's upgoing. So, it's uh, uh, upper motor neuron lesion. So, from here, right, how do we know whether we call this an upper motor neuron lesion or a lower motor neuron lesion? Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. In acute neurological deficit, it is very difficult to get a clear cut. Uh, either this is a uh, uh, upper or this is a uh, lower motor neuron. Okay, uh, one thing that can describe or that can explain this uh, scenario is that it could be Conus medullary syndrome. Okay, because Conus medullary syndrome is a, a, a combination, it's a mixture of both upper and lower motor neuron. Okay. Because in the corners, it contains the cord and also the nerve root. So it is a combination of both upper and motor neuron lesion. All right. So, but in, in most of the time in corners, the knee jerk is preserved or hyper. The ankle jerk may be uh, diminished or hypo, but Babinski is upgoing. Okay. So then again, you go back to the, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, to the, uh, to the uh, physical examination, no? so you have to color, correlate everything. Okay, if your spine tenderness is over mid thoracic, the conus is not there. Conus is over the thoracal uh, lumbar or upper lumbar junction. Okay. Secondly, the sensation. All right. A lot of times, the sensation uh, is involved the uh, lower limbs only. Okay. The uh, trunk most of the time can be normal or it is over lower abdomen only, T10, 11, or 12. Okay, so in this case, if the knee jerk is normal, the ankle is diminished, Babinski is up the way, it can be conus medullary syndrome. Yeah, right. 
Alright, okay. Thank you, Doctor. Alright, so uh, pro uh, so now we proceed. Okay, but then the sensation is reduced over the T11 to L1 region bilaterally. Okay, and also sensation reduced over the right L2 and S2. But from here, I think we know we can quite clearly say that probably the level of the lesion is at around the T11 spinal cord. Okay. And then when we do DRE, uh, anal tone intact, voluntary anal contraction present, perianal sensation intact. Of course, by right, we should also uh, say what is the uh, deep anal pressure. Lah. All right. Okay. So from here, we, uh, so from here, uh, we basically can come up with a provisional diagnosis already. So um, uh, maybe this one we, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, maybe with this one we want to try to open to the floor. Lah. All right. Uh, if anyone wants to volunteer and inf some information, uh, what is the provisional diagnosis? Anyone? Um, uh, any volunteers? Before, before, before going into the provisional, actually, I do have like another one more question, like, just out of curiosity, uh, doctor. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So like over here, like the sensation is quite like quite patchy. Is it like a very common presentation rather than a full blown um, numbness over T11 all the way downwards? OK, so from my experience is that a lot of times in acute setting, okay, and if it is due to uh, extra, um, what do you call that? The extra dural compression, the means compression from outside, okay, it can be patchy, okay, okay. unless in, um, in a complete cord uh, injury, complete cord injury. OK, then you can get a full blown sensory loss or sensory abnormality. OK, the patient can tell you very clearly where is normal, where is abnormal. Okay? OK, in those which are not so compressed, whereby you have a stenosis, you have compression, but it is not so compressed. OK, this compression is from outside, ma, compressing mm. the, the cord, even though the neurological deficit is just one day, but it doesn't mean that the pathology is one day. The pathology yes. can be like a week or two already. It's just that the every day the uh, compression compresses the spinal cord, causing injury, but still the spinal cord doesn't want to give way. It's still okay. So at one day cannot tahan, uh, then the spinal cord give way. So that's why the patient presents with neurological deficit at that time. All right. So in some patient where by the compression is not so much or uh, it's not a, a, or uh, it is not a complete cord uh, injury. Okay, the patient may not have a full-blown uh, sensory loss. You cannot determine, that, like I told you just now, uh, one level abnormal, the proximal level abnormal. Then the lower one may be uh, slightly normal. Then after that, a normal, then after that, abnormal. So it's not a full-blown, uh, clear-cut uh, sensory uh, abnormality. Okay, but whichever is proximal, which is abnormal, you cannot disregard that. You cannot say, ah, that one normal lah. I cannot. Okay. All right. So in this say. case, if T11 is abnormal, T10, then you have to ask the patient. No? You have to check the patient. If T10, whether T10 is normal or not. If T10 patient is very sure, T9 very sure, T8 very sure, everything above it is very sure. The patient say that very sure it is normal. Then T11 is the sensory level. Okay. Mm. All right. Thank you, doctor. Okay. Okay. Thank you, doctor. So, uh. Um, uh, when we talk about diagnosis, we always hear this thing called uh, what? Uh, anatomical diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, and pathological diagnosis. So uh, can Dr. explain a bit what is the difference between all these three? Okay, so for, for not to say for spine, la, for actually for all the orthopedic surgeons, okay, to us, anatomical diagnosis is very, very important. Okay, because we do not want to operate on the wrong level. OK, that's one like not just spine, like uh, osteoarthritis of the knee. You do not want to operate on the left leg. In fact, the patient right leg is more painful, but patient has bilateral uh, knee osteoarthritis. You get what I mean? So anatomical diagnosis is very important. Clinical diagnosis is what the patient presents to you. So in spine, we summarize into eight clinical uh, presentation. OK, eight clinical presentation. So um, Number one is cervical myelopathy, cervical, two, cervical radiculopathy, three, thoracic myelopathy, four, thoracic radiculopathy, 
5 lumbar radiculopathy, 6 lumbar spinal stenosis, 7 deformity, 8 axial back pain. All right. So you try to find out okay, this eight out of this eight clinical presentation, this patient belongs to which one? All right. So I would choose thoracic myelopathy in this case. Okay. All right. That's number one. So then, but then it's not enough. Okay. Which level? Thoracic means T11 until conus. All right. Uh, sorry, T11 until T12. Which level? Uh, then I will say that. That's why I, would I say that the uh, sensory uh, level examination is very important because in the thoracic, there is no, um, um, uh, what do you call that? There is no uh, myotome, only dermatome. So the only, um, um, the only way to find out the neurological level is through sensory. In lower limb, upper limb, yes, you can check the power uh, to, to, to help to determine the level. But in thoracic, there is only sensory level. So that's why sensory examination, like I said just now, is very, very important. So if this patient has got T11, then I will put this T11. No? T11, all right. Pathological diagnosis is what causes the, uh, the, the patient's uh, problem. So in this patient, it could be acute disherniation. It could be... Uh, infection, it could be tumor, it could be something else. All right, so um, you have to understand uh, this. Lab. So a lot of times, uh, based on history and physical examination, very difficult to get the pathological diagnosis, but we can suggest. Okay, but anatomical, it has to be from clinical. So in this patient, you can put this T11 malopathy, uh, secondary to, because you mentioned tenderness is T89. I'm sure later you have another slide on the uh, uh, the uh, correlation between the cord and the vertebra. Uh, T11 malopathy most likely due to uh, spine infections, spinal discitis, or spinal metastasis. Okay, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, thank you, doctor. So actually. Okay, so for the, uh, so in the end of the day, we did have an answer for the provisional diagnosis after history and physical examination. So as we can see here, uh, we suggest that this is a thoracic myelopathy. So this is the clinical diagnosis due to spinal cord compression at T11. So this is our anatomical diagnosis. Okay, with Frankel C neurology. So this is just to look at how severe is the uh, patient's symptoms. All right, so Frankel C neurology. Uh, if, if you're uh, okay, I don't think we're going to go into Frankel uh, classification here, but Frankel neurology is basically when the patient uh, has a motor, uh, uh, motor incomplete lesion and is unable to walk, so we call it a Frankel C. And uh, we have a pathological diagnosis secondary to tumor infection or acute dissonation. So this is basically what we suggest is the pathology. All right, so based on this one, so we want to think about what investigations we would like to order. So uh, maybe Aaron, you want to uh, suggest what investigations you think you want to order? All right, uh, maybe we open the floor first. Anyone would want to try out? Yeah, anyone would want to try out, yeah. Okay, maybe we can start off with like imaging. Like what is the most basic imaging that we can do for these type of yeah. patients? So, for, for, yeah, so um, for, if you ask me, I think I would do a x-ray first, la, uh, spinal x-ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. plain or radiograph. Plain, plain radiograph. La. Yeah. Okay, and so actually, uh, we do have a plain radiograph here uh, for the for the, uh, uh, for the patient. So, I think, I think when we talk about plain radiograph, we must also, I think it's very important to mention which part of the radiograph. I think a lot of spine surgeons are very particular with this. Like, when you order a radiograph, you don't say you do a whole spine radiograph, but rather which part of the spine. So yeah, I think in this patient, since he actually complained of thoracic back pain, so I'll do a thoracic plane radiograph la, rather than a thoracolumbar because it's a mid-thoracic one, right? Um, okay. Doctor, do you have anything to add on about that? Yeah. Um... In this case, you can just do a tricolumbar or thoracic, it's okay. 
Yeah, because uh, if to be very precise, it's thoracic lumbar. Uh, if not, you can order thoracic because thoracic bar is T1 to T12, ma, right? Yeah, so it should cover the whole uh, area that uh, the the whole area of interest lah. So yes, you can order a thoracic X-ray, both AP and lateral. Okay, so doctor, in terms of the thoracic, uh, in terms of a, a spine X-ray, right? Uh, what do we generally look for in the uh, plane radiograph? All right. So again, according to my teacher, Prof. Chris, uh, he said that there are only three things you look in the X-ray. Okay, of course, there are many things, uh, but three important things that you must look in the X-ray is that number one, fracture. Okay, you don't miss a fracture. Okay, number two, end plate erosion. Because end plate erosion means that infection. Okay, so you can see that in the vertebra, uh, if you are seeing the lateral view, the best is to see the lateral view. In this patient, AP view also can see already. In a lateral view, if you go to the level uh, near the diaphragm there, uh, diaphragm, diaphragm, yeah, yeah, that level, if you can see the, uh, the vertebra, right, you can see the top and bottom, the superior end plate and inferior end plate is uh, a bit more sclerotic, it's whitish, right? So that is normal. A bit more sclerotic. Then, if you go two levels up, uh, the infection part. Okay, that one you see that the not not this one, the higher the the pathological problem. Yeah. So that area, there is end plate erosion, both the superior end plate of the lower vertebra and inferior end plate of the upper vertebra, and then there's a cavity in front. All right, with a kyphotic deformity in this patient. So you must look for the end plate erosion. Uh, lastly is pedicle erosion. So pedicle erosion, there are a few uh, terms whether you can use pedicle erosion, you can use pediculolysis, or you can use winking out sign if one side or blinking out sign if both, both sides, right? So if you can see, um, yeah, slightly blur, this one. So you can see pedicle in the pedicle uh, in the vertebra, that one you have seen in the AP view. So you can see the vertebra, there are two two pedicles at the side, so that is normal, all right? If one side don't have, it's like an owl, because owl, the eyes at the, at the, at the side, no, not at the side, the owl is at the front, all right? So if one side don't have already, means it's a blink, uh, sorry, it's a winking owl sign. So that indicates a uh, spine max. So on top of that, you can look for uh, alignment, uh, whether there is scoliosis or kyphosis, you can look for uh, degenerative changes, okay, osteophyte, synesmophyte, all right. Uh, you can look for uh, any listesis. Yeah, so that is not so important because if you miss a scoliosis, because if it's a very severe scoliosis, you won't miss, lah, right? That one, that one, no need to become a medical uh, 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 um, person, lah, right? You can also see that it's a scoliosis. Okay, the only thing you may miss is just a mouse scoliosis because that is not urgent. All right, you miss a kyphosis, a little bit of kyphosis, that is not urgent. All right, but if you miss trauma, fracture, infection, and tumor, that is very disastrous. Yeah, all right, yeah, back to you, Chan. Yeah, so just to summarize, so the three things that we want to look for, the three main things that we don't want to miss is a fracture, uh, uh, end plate erosion and uh, loss of pedicles. Okay, so all right. So actually, from here we can actually see, yeah, like just now what Doctor mentioned. So there's a, a end plate erosion at about T8 and T9. Okay, and also loss of vertebral body height in T8 and T9 vertebra. Lah. Okay, so from here, right, mm, Aaron, what do you think that this is the? What do you think this uh, pathology is like? Um, I think just now Dr. actually mentioned like yeah. what the, the three main yeah. things that we need to look out yeah. for, right? So yeah. um, fracture is fracture. So end plate erosion um, usually is suggestive of infection and yeah. um, pedicle erosion is um, suggestive of uh, spine metastasis, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so in this case, it's pointing more towards infection. La. Yeah, okay. So it's an infection. So, um, uh, besides a plain radiograph, I think uh, because the patient has some uh, neurological problems, right? So I think it's warranted that we do an MRI 
also, okay, with contrast because in infection, inflammation. So I believe contrast is the one that is able to differentiate it better, right, doctor? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yes. Uh, yep, okay. So before we move on to the any MRI, so I think we want to talk a bit about the correlation between the spinal cord and vertebral segment. Doctor, you want to talk about this slide a little bit? Yeah, I can, no problem. So uh, one thing you have to understand uh, the anatomy is that the spinal cord ends at L1-2 uh, level of the uh, uh, vertebra. So now here I use two, two terms. Like one is spinal cord, one is vertebral uh, segment or vertebral column. Vertebral column means your spine, la, your bone. La. All right. So spinal cord ends at L1-2 level of the vertebral column of the spine. Okay. So it means that the cord is shorter in relation to the spine. Right? Understand? Correct? Okay, but the numbering is the same. That means if you have a, a, you have a L5 a, a segment, you have a L5 vertebra. All right? So the, the nerve root has to come from the spinal cord and go all the way down and come out as a nerve root at L5. Right? So what happened is that when the spinal cord is shorter than the spine, Okay, the spinal cord numbers are, uh, how to say, uh, the spinal cord numbers are higher. The spinal cord numbering, the spinal cord segment should be higher than the vertebra. You get what I mean? Because in order for the spinal cord uh, to yes, end at L1-2, so the, the spinal cord segment number will be higher than the vertebral column. All right, so for example, if you have cervical, in the cervical, okay, the cervical region, the spinal cord segment should add one segment. So for example, if you have a C5 uh, vertebra, oh, you have an example here. So, okay, so I finished first. So cervical add one segment, upper thoracic add two segment, lower thoracic add three segment. Okay, that means, okay, so far I understand. Then after in the corners, uh, you ask a doctor in the corners how, that one is a bit mixed up. La. So that's why that this, I, I say it's a mixture of uh, both upper and motor, a lower motor neuron lesion. So it is not so easy to determine that level. So this is just a rough guide. It's not a hard and, fa hard and fast rate. It must be, it must be at one, at two, at three, no. Okay, is that around that region? Okay, so for example, over here, uh, Chan has put up the examples here. If it is a T8 vertebra, T8 vertebra, which spinal cord level is affected? So T8 is lower thoracic. So T8 lower thoracic ma, at three segment. So the spinal cord uh, level is T11. Yeah, around that region, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, right? Uh, if it is T4 thoracic vertebra, T4 vertebra, which cord segment? So T4 is upper thoracic. T4 plus 2 is T6, huh? cord segment. If it is C4 vertebra, which cord level? C4 is cervical. Uh, cervical is uh, at one segment. So C4 plus 1 is C5, huh? cord level, C5. C4 vertebra, C5 cord uh, spinal cord level, spinal cord segment. Uh, C7 vertebra, which cord level? C1. Uh -huh. Uh, this one I ask you back. La. If C7, this is a trick, trick question, uh, Chan purposely one, I think. They want to <laughs> trick you. If C7 vertebra, which is the spinal cord segment? Oh, C8. <laughs> uh, yeah, where's the vehicle got eight? Uh, so C8. All right. I also nearly can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because the first three are the same. Uh, right. So, so understand? Okay. So, but one thing you have to you have to you have to remember this is that okay this is theory it doesn't have to be exactly the same all right but it can tell you roughly that level okay second thing is that you have to understand in your physical in your um uh, when you see a patient okay the patient will not tell you which vertebra level the patient can tell you the spinal cord level by telling you the neurological level, which on uh, which myotome is weak, uh, which is the sensory level. Okay, you get what I mean? All right. 
then you have to back, uh, you have to, uh, you have to, uh, how to say, uh, you have to backtrack, you have to trace back where is the vertebral level. Because for us, you have to know, we want to scan uh, which level. Number two, we want to operate which level. We, when you operate, when you want to decompress a spinal cord, you are, you are, you are doing a bony work, bone work. You're decompressing the bone. You are not doing a surgery for the cord level. You get what I mean? You have to go through the bone first. Ma. So that's why identification or correlation of this cord and the vertebra is very important. So say for someone in this patient, he has a T11 level, right? T11 level, right? So we yes. suspect the vertebra involved is T8. This plus three, ma, right? T8, okay? So then I must make sure that my x-ray must include T8. So you can do a thoracic x-ray. MRI, I must include T8. So you can do a thoracolumbar MRI, it's okay. Then when you do surgery, when you open up, when you do a surgery, you're opening up T8 vertebra. Then only you can reach the cord level, which is T11, right? So that's why this is very important. The correlation is very important. Okay? Mm. Okay, thanks, doctor, for the explanation. Actually, for me, I find this uh, actually a very helpful slide. That's why I put it inside. Yeah, so here is the MRI for the patient. Okay, so this is the contrasted MRI. So usually, doctor, in MRI, right, uh, what we want to really look for is actually uh, the either spinal cord compression or the nerve compression, right? So from here, I think there is very obvious that there is some form of compression over here. Okay, and because there's a lot of hyper intense regions, so Basically, I would think that there's a lot of inflammation over here, right, doctor? Mm, yes, yes. You're right. Okay. So in yep. terms of the yeah axial cut, so axial cut also uh, usually uh, how do we look for in the how do we know that there's a compression now? Because for axial cut, uh, I'm not sure like, here if there is any compression here. Yeah. So the in the MRI again, uh, because uh, from the history and physical examination, you are quite sure the level already. Okay, but I want to confirm, number one. So MRI can confirm the level. Okay, say for example, you have a T89 with the X-ray T89 discitis. I want to confirm the level. So that's number one. Number two, I want to know how bad the uh, spinal cord compression is. Okay, then number three, what is the pathology? What is the pathology? So if you can move to, so confirm the level, confirm already. No? This is T89, no? All right, done already. Number two, uh, how bad is the cord compression is? So uh, the best to look at is the uh, T2 uh, image. So you can move on to T2 image. Okay, so in the T2 image, in the sagittal cut here, all right, you can see that there is some compression to the spinal cord anteriorly, but this is not very, very bad in this slide. So then, Sagittal cut is not the best cut to, to see compression because sagittal cut, it cuts like this, sagittally. So the cord is only 1 cm. So you may not be able to cut exactly at the tightest area. So the best way to, the, the best view to see is the axial cut. All right. Uh, even, though, even though it's, like I said, it's not really compressing, but actually it is very severe because there is a gap there's a defect in the uh, anteriorly. So when the patient sits up, when the patient moves, it can cause uh, instability. This is very unstable. So whenever patient moves, it can compress the spinal cord. Okay, then you go to the axial cut. So in the axial cut, you can see here more uh, clearly is that uh, in the uh, number one, is you can see surrounding it, the, the center is the spinal cord. And then surrounding it is the uh, infection. It could be abscess, it could be slough, and all that. Then you can see number two is getting more compressed. Slide number two is getting more compressed, especially from the uh, left side. Then number three, you can see anteriorly is from anteriorly. Slide number three is from anteriorly. And slide number four is uh, a bit uh, is the uh, lower cuts already, so it, it's uh, less uh, compression. All right. So I know that this is. Uh, quite a severe canal stenosis with a spinal cord compression. 
okay, due to uh, infection. Okay, then most likely it's infection, uh, right? Seeing this uh, cut, but I want to co confirm it further. You can see the contrast cut. Then you go to the contrasted uh, scan. So in the contrasted scan, uh, the one arrow pointing is the T89 uh, disk space. On the left-hand side, the pink color arrow is pointing at T89 level. All right, that is the T7 vertebra is also uh, hyper intense. It's also contrast enhanced. Right? So there is infection there as well. Okay, so in this patient, you can see that T89, the whole disk is lightened up. The whole disk is uh, uh, enhanced. And then there is pre-vertebral and epidural extension or enhancement. Then you see on the right-hand side, the image, the whole area surrounding the spinal cord is enhanced also. All right, and you see on the right side, uh, sorry, right lung, not right side, right lung, surrounding is it's like an it's like a lung abscess, all right? At the center, it is uh, uh, iso intense, and then it's a bit heterogeneous over the anterior side, and surrounding it, okay, it's uh, hyper intense and contrast enhanced. It's like a lung infection, so it's direct spread to the lung or the from the lung is direct spread to the spine. Not sure which is which lah. Okay, I presume. Uh, should be from the spine spreading to the lung because it should be from a high pressure to a low pressure. So, uh, so in these uh, images, these images point towards more on infection rather than uh, tumor. Definitely not this this herniation. Lah. Okay, because tumor you have uh, pedicle enhancement, you have uh, the uh, curtain sign, right? The tumor doesn't show this kind of images. Okay, so this is infection. All right. Okay. Thank you, doctor. But then uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, doctor, infection can be divided into many, right? Like uh, if it's, uh, okay, but first we look at inside this one first. Huh? So this one, if you look at the chest x-ray, okay, so we can see that there is a well-rounded opacity at the lower lobe of the right lung, okay? So here's the uh, well-rounded opacity of the right lower lobe is central lucency. So there's some central lucency or maybe it's an abscess. Huh? Okay. But doctor, we, this one, uh, can we say that this is a, uh, because infection got many tests, right? But we want to rule out uh, whether it's a TB or it's an infection. So from here, right, doctor think this is a TB or this is an infection? Yeah, this is pyogenic bacterial. Okay, so a pyogenic, uh, yeah, yeah. pyogenic is one. So, so one thing is that, uh, um, again, um, uh, one thing is that um, the most important, uh, so you always uh, you go from the history, PE, and uh, scans. So number one is uh, the, the uh, acute onset. So TB usually is a bit more uh, chronic, so acute onset. Number two is over the thoracic spine, but most of the time, pyogenic is in the lumbar, but it can still occur in the thoracic. So that is not a very important uh, uh, feature. Uh, three, okay, if you want to talk about the uh, uh, features, la, skip lesion. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, doctor, uh, maybe we a... show the features. Ah, uh, okay, can, can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then we can rule out one by one. So when you want to uh, remember the features, you're either from outside, inside, or inside, outside. Okay, so uh, the chronicity uh, level, uh, skip lesion. Right? Skip lesion is more common in TB. That means you have... Uh, Maybe you have T12 and then T5 and then T3, right? So this is skip lesion, not contiguous, all right? So the next one, which is very, very important, is the disk involvement. In pyogenic, they have early disk involvement, pyogenic. In TB, they have late disk involvement. So if, say, for example, the whole disk is eroded already, in, and in this case, the whole disk is eroded, in the MRI, it shows uh, contrast enhanced, there's a pan discitis involvement. So this is pyogenic. TB usually involves the anterior third only. But of course, you can say that, hey, doctor, this one looks like there's a kyphotic deformity, right? So, but this is not, it doesn't uh, point towards TB because the whole this is involved, okay? So uh, TB, either anterior third uh, erosion or uh, late uh, this involvement. So the disc usually preserve, even though in very severe kyphotic deformity, the disc is uh, uh, preserved. Okay. Uh, the next is that in pyogenic, they usually have a lot of uh, surrounding uh, 
uh, extension, they have pre vertebral abscess, they have epidural uh, abscess. All right. So in this case, yes, for TB, most of the time is para vertebral abscess or psoas abscess. Okay. So if you if you read uh, further, uh, the psoas abscess in TB also known as cold abscess, because in the olden days, whereby they do not have uh, this uh, MRI or or other scans, they used to do bone scan. So in bone scan, there is no uptake, negative uptake. So that's why they known they call the uh, uh, TB psoas abscess as cold abscess. All right. Yeah. So these are the uh, important uh, features to differentiate both lah. All right. OK, thank you, doctor. OK, so um, so this is our final diagnosis. Lab. So from there, we know that this is a thoracic myelopathy due to spinal cord compression at T11 uh, with Franco C neurology secondary to pyogenic spondylodicitis. OK. So the management. So technically uh, management when it's infection, doctor, we you, we always uh, divide into conservative and surgical management, right, doctor? So yeah. In this case, uh, so for this patient, uh, we did sputum cultures. Okay, there's a okay. So zeal Nelson stain negative for acid fast bacilli and TCR negative for tuberculosis. So blood cultures found Klebsiella pneumonia. Okay, which is uh, sensitive to augmentin. Okay, so and then the tumor markers are negative. All right, so basically this uh, this uh, pyogenic spondylar disease is mainly the uh, etiology is the Klebsiella pneumonia sensitive to augmentin. So, doctor, usually uh, this type of patients, right, we, um, uh, in terms of the antibiotics, we start off empirically. So, what sort of empirical antibiotics do we usually give for uh, pyogenic spondylodicitis while waiting for blood cultures? Uh, doctor, I think you're muted. Yeah, in our practice, uh, normally, we do not start empirical antibiotics until we obtain a biopsy or a culture. Okay, yeah, because if you start empirical antibiotics in a spine infection, you may not be able to, you know, you you will, uh, you may not be able to obtain uh, the uh, bacteria to get a culture. Okay, so if possible, we try not to start empirical antibiotics. Okay. All right, in a uh, spine infection, we will wait until we go uh, take a culture, take a biopsy, or going for surgery. Then we start. Once we once we obtain a biopsy, then we will start the empirical antibiotics. Okay, while waiting for the culture results. So we do not start before surgery or before biopsy. We start after. Okay, so what empirical antibiotics? Then you have to ask yourself, what is the most common bacteria? Uh, uh, what is the most common organism uh, in spine infection? So the, the most common organism in spine infection, again, it is always staph aureus. So I will start uh, cloxacetylene. Okay, but in very severe infection patient, and then we may start other things, uh, unicin, augmentin, all right, or some other broad spectrum metalatomase inhibitor. Okay, yeah. Uh, but doctor, uh, usually uh, in normal patients, do we usually, uh, with pyogenic spondylodicitis, uh, do we usually send them to surgery? Uh? Uh, no. So there are few indications for surgery. In fact, if you, um, if you notice our practice, most of the time in infection, we treat conservatively. All right. Because you have to understand, in the spine will always, the spine is very vascular. It's a lot of blood vessels. So the infection will soon be controlled and the bone will grow and, and fuse the, uh, the infected uh, disc, all right? So the patient will improve, but it may take time, okay? So there are a few indications for surgery. Number one is severe instability. Ah, you have it here. Uh, number one is progressive neurological deficit. So in this patient, you cannot treat conservative, all right? So you have to go in as soon as possible, all right? Because of neurological deficit. Number two is severe instability pain. Patient cannot get up. Patient lie down, bit bound only. Cannot sit up at all. Then he can do surgery. A uh, kyphotic deformity norm, uh, usually is in TB, whereby a uh, patient has got a severe or uh, kyphotic deformity, 
and there's a risk of neurological or late neurological deficit. So if you read further, there's this late onset paraplegia in TB spine because due to the kyphosis, not because of the acute infection. All right. So then you can do surgery uh, for culture or biopsy. Uh, say, for example, in those not in this patient, uh, we normally do a trans biopsy under fluoroscopic guidance or under CT guidance guidance. Okay, so you can obtain a biopsy. Uh, failure of conservative treatment. Okay, despite of antibiotics, patient is still not improving. Then you may, uh, this is relative indication. Okay, spinal epidural ab abscess is also a relative indication. Okay, unless it's in the uh, cervical or thoracic and patient has neurology, then we will do surgery. If it's just uh, uh, epidural abscess, probably in the lumbar, there is no neurological deficit, we will still treat conservatively with antibiotics. But a long-term antibiotics, three months minimum. So for this patient, because she has progressive neurological deficit and also a spinal epidural abscess at the uh, thoracic region, so I think these are the indications for surgery in this patient, right? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, so I think we have... Uh... We are done with the first case. Um, yeah, so, so uh, if anyone got any questions, right, uh, maybe you can uh, put it down on the chat box, okay? Once we are done with the second case and then towards the end, maybe we can uh, uh, address some of those questions lah, if there are questions, all right? Okay. Proceed, Aaron. Okay, so now we are going into the second case. Um, sorry, because we are taking a bit more time than we initially expected lah. Okay, uh, Chicken, can you pass I over talk the too much, uh. <laughs> Sorry? I talk too much. Uh. <laughs> no, la, doctor, you are giving a lot of important <laughs> uh, information okay. that we yeah. as medical students should know about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, so now uh, we'll move on to the second case. Okay. Uh, Can, um, can you pass oh, over the uh, control the again? The doesn't want, to control, <laughs> the want, want you to proceed. La. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I can't really control. I don't know why now. Uh, Chicken, why not you just okay, have to control? Uh, uh, okay, okay. Uh, cancel. Uh, give control. Uh. Okay, can. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, why is it so slow? All right, so we'll start with our second case. So second case, Mr. S, 68 year old Indian gentleman, um, presented with three months history of heat pain. So upon further questioning, he said that he actually have a hip pain radiating from the lateral gluteal region to the lateral thigh. And also, he also has pain from the groin region radiating to the anterior thigh and knee. All right, so from here we can see that there's actually a dilemma, a diagnostic dilemma. So patient actually presented with two, um, two kinds of, uh, two patterns of radicular pain. Okay, so in this sort of case, um, what do you think about it, doctor? Like, do we consider like there's a possibility that um, there's too radicular pain? If let's say like from our understanding, lateral gluteal to lateral thigh will probably be a L5 and groin region to anterior thigh and knee will be a L3. So do we think about a double radiculopathy? Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, so in this patient, uh, very important is the determination of the uh, level and also uh, which uh, anatomy. So if the patient has got only thigh pain, it is very difficult to, to ascertain whether this is 4, 5, S1 or probably it's from the hip or from the knee. So in this patient, you must rule out three things, whether it is from the hip, it is from the knee or from the uh, uh, spine. Of course, there are some other diagnoses like piriformis fossa and 
I don't really like to mention this is because um, there is no proof, okay, no uh, evidence from the imaging, so very difficult to to diagnose. So uh, second thing is that if the patient has got leg pain, all right, then you can ask uh, whether the pain goes to the calf, lateral part of the calf, uh, goes to the dorsum, or in the great toe. This is L five. Or whether it's a medial calf, this is L4. Or whether it's a posterior calf to the heel, to the sole of the foot, this is S1. So then you're very certain. If it's just lateral gluteal uh, to the lateral tie, it's very difficult to confirm that this is uh, L5 or it could be just muscle pain, right? Then the second thing is that you must ask uh, how, uh, what is the nature of the pain? Is it cramping or is it shooting pain, radicular pain? Uh, somehow patient can tell lah. All right, so the lateral tie, uh, sorry, lateral gluteal to lateral tie, I'm not sure whether this is from the spine or from the hip. Okay, then the second symptom, which is, because patient has got hip pain, you see, so then you must ask the hip pain, uh, is it anterior hip or posterior hip? Okay, if it is anterior hip, most of the time it is a hip uh, in origin, not from the spine, if it's anterior hip. So you ask the patient to point to you, like in this photo, if the hand move a bit more medial uh, and higher, so it point towards your anterior hip, all right? So most of the time, that is a hip in origin. Then your second symptom here, pain from the groin and radiate to the anterior thigh and knee. So again, I will say this is from the hip. This is not from the spine. Because spine doesn't come from the groin. Uh. So it comes, usually spine starts from gluteal, buttock region, gluteal or lower back. Okay, then it radiates to the anterior tie. Then yes, that it could that could be L3. Or sorry, uh anterior tie or the knee. That could be L3. Yeah. Okay, all right. So okay. So to continue, I think um the questions we will just run uh, a bit quick quickly this time. Lah. So I think we already mentioned about the symptoms lah, of uh when we talk about spine conditions, right? So back pain, limb pain, so patient actually has that uh, gluteal region pain, lateral gluteal region pain, as well as the groin pain. Lah. So we will ask our typical pain questions. So side onset characteristics, radiating, aggravating factor, relieving factor, and whatnot. So and then that is a limb weakness, numbness, as well as um, bowel and urinary symptoms. Lah. So it will be roughly the same few questions. Am I right, doctor? Uh, yes. On top of that, in this patient, uh, for me, the most important uh, subsequent question that I'm going to ask is that I will always ask the patient to commit, use a finger and point to uh, on, on his body uh, where does the pain start and where does it end. So you must ask mm -hmm. him to point. Uh, secondly, is that you must ask about aggravating and relieving factor. Okay, so when is the worst time that he has the pain while doing what? Is it from, you know, some patient when you sit for too long, they want to get up, uh, then he has, the, he has the pain. That is startup pain. Startup pain is arthritic pain. Mm -hmm. They may sitting for too long, then want to stand up, uh, that is startup pain. If the patient tell you that, you know, after walking for some time, or right, uh, then the pain starts, uh, it could be from the spine, okay? Then the, whatever that involves a lot of uh, flexion and movement of the, hip joint, all right, uh, that, is, that may indicate a hip pathology. Say for example, uh, getting up from a sitting position, uh, climbing up and down the staircase, squatting, squatting toilet, okay, squatting, uh, getting in and out of the car, because car is very low, ma, so getting in and out of the car, wearing trousers, pants, yeah, so um, these are the uh, important questions. La. Okay, understood, doctor. So just a quick recap. So for this this condition, uh, for this presentation, most of the, to, to actually find out the main pathology, it's important to actually know about the aggravating factors. Lah. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so now we are on. Okay, so this is the full history of the patient. So actually, Mr. S has been experiencing the right hip pain for the past 10 years. 
which has been worsened in the past three months. Lah. So it's also important to actually ascertain three months, uh, whether is it starting started abruptly or not. Lah. So the worst pain, as um, doctor actually mentioned, so make the patient commit to it. So actually the patient mentioned the worst pain is actually at the lateral gluteal region radiating to the lateral thigh. So that's the worst pain as compared to the pain at the groin region. Lah. And the characteristic of the pain is described as a shooting pain. And patient actually mentioned that pain is actually worsened with prolonged ambulation and with movement such as sitting to standing, so upon changing of posture. So in the past three months, pain was intermittent. Eh, in the past, sorry. In the past, pain was intermittent and relief with analgesia. However, for the past three months, it has been constant and not relieved with painkiller. Pain scored 10 out of 10 after painkiller, 7 out of 10. Pain relief with rest, no rest pain, no night pain, or no claudication pain. Okay, so doctor, based on the pain history itself, what do you think about the patient's condition at this point? Yeah, so from, from this history, it, it is more like a hip origin, more like a hip pain. Okay, okay. so you can uh, uh, further supplement whether there's any pain on squatting. Can a patient squat? Uh, wearing pants, getting in and out of the car. So these okay. are the, uh, uh, you can supplement uh, uh, it. Alright, All right, okay. uh, on top okay. of that, whether there's any back pain. But sometimes as you see, uh, patients usually they have uh, pain everywhere. One. The, mo the, the moment you ask. True, right? true. So you must uh, digest what the patient tell you. Okay, understood. So um, before we move on, so I actually underline claudication pain here. Lah. So um, actually, doctor, I, I want to like um, ask you because, um, okay, I for one didn't really clock that many radicular petty pain patients. Lah, but sometimes when we ask the patient, patients say, oh, I already got pain since at the moment I actually stand up. So how in those cases, do I need to further ask about claudication pain? Or I just stop there and just assume that patient does not have claudication pain since the moment he stands up, he already has the pain and that, that specific pattern of pain. Yeah, so you must ask the claudication pain because claudication pain indicates uh, either it's the spine or vascular. Lah, all right, mm. so you must ask claudication pain. Uh, in arthritic pain, patient may have, say for example, patient has sit for too long, prolonged immobilization, and then the patient moves, all right? Uh, that is the worst pain. But after the patient walks for a few seconds or a few minutes, the pain improves. That is very typical or very classical of arthritic pain. Mm -hmm. So if this patient says that, oh, the pain relief after walking for uh, a few, uh, one or two minutes, a few minutes, uh, that this is more suggestive of uh, arthritic pain. Okay, all right, understood, mm -hmm. doctor. So we will move on. Okay, so the continuation of the history. So besides that, patient also has low back pain in which he localizes to the lumbar region. However, patient claims that the pain doesn't bother him. So patient also has numbness over the dorsum of the right foot. Patient also has weakness of the right leg with multiple history of falls. Functionally, he has not been able to get up from squatting to standing for the past 10 years. Since two weeks ago, patient has not been able to walk due to the pain. Prior to that, he was walking with the aid of a walking stick. Um, otherwise, um, patient also has left knee pain, bilateral shoulder pain. He has visited private a private hospital to have intra-articular injection. Patient reported pain was relieved for one week, which then recurred. So um, upon further questioning, so since there's already neurological symptoms here, so doctor, what do you think now? Yeah, so uh, again, um uh, the numbness is not specific, so you can you must uh, confirm the patient again with the patient again. What do you mean by numbness? Is mm -hmm. he having diabetic? How about the left side? Is there any numbness over the left side? All right, mm -hmm. and uh, is there any other you know trauma or what to the right foot? How long was the numbness already? So because the patient cannot just have numbness over the dorsal of the right foot. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not saying that it is not L5. It can still be L5, but we must be uh, uh, a certain because this patient is a diagnostic uh, issue. Patient has pain everywhere. This is a diagnostic issue. 
issue. Okay. So you must ascertain that. The second thing regarding the weakness over the right leg with history of multiple falls, uh, you must convert with the patient. What do you mean by weakness? Mm. Because sometimes patient has pain and then patient can also feel weak because it's painful. Ma. So he's not sure. putting a lot of weight over that leg. So then he fell down. So he mm. may attribute that to weakness. And in fact, it is not weakness. So you must mm. uh, convert with the patient. What do you mean by weakness? Is it because of the pain or what? All right. So the functional status uh, not being able to get from squatting to standing position. Uh, then again, you must ask why. Why why you can't stand up from squatting position? Yeah. So all these things. Uh, and then uh, next one is uh, he was walking with eight with of a walking stick. So usually, back pain or spine uh, radicular pain, usually patients do not walk with walking stick, usually, right. usually, but can, okay. but usually not, okay, right. only in very severe pain. But if you have a hip or knee uh, osteoarthritis, the likelihood of you using a walking stick is higher, all right, mm. so then you must uh, uh, confirm again, no? yeah. The fact okay. that I'm not in the favor of the spine is that, uh, the radicular pain is not uh, very typical mm -hmm. uh, of a spine. Yeah. Right, mm. understood, doctor. All right. Okay, moving on. Okay. So otherwise, he doesn't have numbers or weakness of the left leg, no saddle anesthesia, no change in bowel bladder habit, no fever, loss of weight, loss of appetite, and night sweats or cough. So these are the things that we do not even expect for this patient. Lah. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so the past medical history, he's actually uh, diagnosed with diabetes, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia 10 years ago. He's on one oral hypoglycemia, one antihypertensive, one on statins. Claim compliance, however, patient do not do self-monitoring. So as what doctor actually mentioned, yes, um, he is a diabetic. So probably it's important to also ascertain whether the uh, numbness that he actually claimed to confirm whether on the left leg also he got numbness or not. Lah. Okay. Moving on. Okay, past surgical history. Eight years ago, he actually had a right total knee replacement. And uh, 40 years ago, hand surgery after being involved in motor vehicle accident. So um, in this case, uh, probably, as what doctor actually mentioned just now, uh, more of a hip condition or knee condition. Right, doctor? Uh, yes. So since this patient has got a TKR done on the uh, ipsilateral side, then you mm -hmm. must check again whether the pain is from the knee or not. Yeah. So this is another uh, differential. Okay, all right. Okay, family history not significant, social history. So he's retired since 10 years ago. So um, the important occupational history, he has actually worked in a palm oil estate, lah, carrying heavy weights frequently. So probably more of an arthritic condition. Lah. Okay. So moving on to physical examination. All right, uh, maybe I'll ask she can. Lah. So for this patient, uh, what examination will you consider doing? So uh, since we're moving towards a hip one, so I think we do a hip examination first, but because he also come with lower back pain and then some bit of numbness, I think it's also warranted that we can do a spine examination also. What do you think, doctor? Yeah, so in this patient, you have to do all three. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But right. I will focus on the hip first, uh, then the spine, then the knee, the right okay. knee. Okay, because uh, in the hip, um, most importantly, because I know that in the hip examination, there are a lot of things to examine, right? Uh, as a, for a medical student. Uh, but you have to prioritize. You don't have to check limb length discrepancy in this patient. That is not our priority. Our priority is that where does the pain come from? So in the hip, you must check for, yes, you can examine for hip tenderness, uh, but it's a bit difficult because the hip is very deep. Um, then to elicit tenderness, uh, elicit pain by doing a range of motion as a uh, uh, examination. So if it is from the hip, if you flex the hip, patient will have pain. 
because and, and understand if it is a hip OA, patient will, will feel or will complain of pain when you flex the hip. Okay, plus minus internal internally rotate the hip. Okay, so if you flex the hip, patient complain of pain, then it's from the hip. Lah. Okay, or flex plus minus internally rotating the hip, and then most likely it's from the hip. It's a hip OA. Okay, that is a very important uh, sign. You must elicit that. Okay. Then of course you must check the range of motion now. Okay, whether the, the, the hip range is uh, limited or not. For the knee as well, you have to do a uh, uh, you have to elicit, try to elicit the pain. You can flex the knee. Okay, if the patient complains of pain, then yes, it's, it's, it, it can be from the knee. Okay. For the spine, most likely you cannot get any positive findings because page, this patient has no neurological deficits. So all your uh, neurological examination, your uh, power, probably everything will be uh, grade five. Uh, tone reflex all normal, and sensory probably it will be normal as well. Okay, and then when you examine the spine, yes, you may find some tenderness over the lumbosacral area. Okay, but that is not. Uh, I mean, it is not uh, strong enough to 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 confirm that this is from the spine. Yeah. Because patient may have uh, uh, any patient that, uh, even though you and me we have back pain, but we don't have hip pain. All right. So most of the elderly patient, and this patient has been working for quite hard, you know, previously. So definitely he will have uh, back pain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. So moving on to the findings, since we already discussed what examinations you would like to do. So general inspection, he actually came in with a wheelchair lah. And Mr. S is also obese and uh, there was also a walking stick next to him. So we can see that since he's also obese, it's also another risk factor for arthritis. La. OK, next. Uh, OK, so the lumbar spine examination. OK, uh, so upon standing, uh, he actually has a slight tilt to the left. There is hyperkyphosis. So um, what I mean here is actually like more of a stooping posture. La. So doctor, so in this case, can I actually use the word hyperkyphosis or it's better if I just describe it as like a stooping posture? Yeah, so it's better to describe as a stoop posture because uh, when you mention hyperkyphosis, what do you mean? Is it the cervical? Is it thoracic or is it lumbar? So mm. uh, uh, hyperkyphosis means that in normal situation, it's already kyphotic, so there will be hyperkyphosis. If you are talking about lumbar, lumbar is low dosis, so it is not right to use a lumbar hyperkyphosis. Or probably you can use a reduced lumbar kyphosis or lumbar kyphosis. Oh, sorry, reduced lumbar low dosis or lumbar kyphosis. But in clinical examination, uh, the uh, safer way to say is just to posture. Lah. Okay. But if you are very sure. Okay, the uh, thoracic is small kyphotic or the lumbar, there's a, a reduced lumbar lordosis, then of course, yes, you can use it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So on palpation, um, uh, warmth is equal, so there's no, irreduce, uh, no increased warm. And uh, as expected, he also has tenderness, which is very non-specific. So we actually get, uh, I actually try to get the patient to walk a bit and he actually has this antalgic gait and requires walking aid. Lah which is um, probably due to probably arthritic joints. Um, lumbar spine movement is restriction in the movement in all range of motion of the lumbar spine. However, upon doing straight leg tests, it was positive uh, on the right leg at 30 degrees. So doctor, what do you think about this? Like is straight leg test actually um, specific or sensitive in this case? OK, I, I want to ask you one thing. What do you mean by SRI? positive in this case? Uh, so that means like uh, we actually try to ask the patient. So uh, when he actually uh, we raise the leg passively, uh, straighten the leg and then raise the uh, flex the uh, hip joint and um, uh, with a straightened knee joint. OK, so as we raised it and then we asked the patient whether there's any pain. And when he said pain, we ask him, uh, I actually ask him whether is it the same pain, the shooting pain that he experienced? And he mentioned yes la, at that time. Where is yeah. the pain? He said it was the lateral, like the lateral gluteal to lateral thigh. 
team. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So you have to be aware with the uh, SRR test. Uh, by right, SRR test positive means that the pain goes beyond the knee. Oh, okay. Okay. At the range less than 60 degrees. Mm. Uh, flexion, hip flexion. All right. So if it is not beyond the knee, it's not SLR. Because SLR is a test that to, to stretch your sciatic nerve. It's a sciatic uh, stretch test. Okay, it is also a sciatic nerve uh, stretch test. So if sciatic nerve goes until the, the beyond the knee, right, to yes. your legs, isn't it? Yeah. So when you stretch it, you want to reproduce the pain that the patient is having. So the pain should go beyond, the pain should go beyond the knee, distal to the knee. So if the pain doesn't go beyond the knee, this is not uh, positive. Okay. 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 Yeah, so muscle stretching or whatever, it can still cause pain over the lateral lateral part of the, the thigh. So if it's just, if it's not beyond the knee, it's not SRR positive. Yeah. Okay, all right. Mm. Okay, probably I did. Probably my technique then was wrong. <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay, I think it's a good note for every one of us here. Mm -hmm. la, that straight leg test, the pain must be reproduced and the pain must um, be extending beyond the knee. Okay. Because a lot of times when patients have pain, right, when you move the, the when trying to uh, move the lower limb, the patient will have pain. But this is not SLR because theoretically SLR means the pain goes beyond the knee. And usually it doesn't, uh, it will not be positive, it will be negative in most chronic cases. The gen cases, everything, it will be negative. It only will be, it will only be positive in acute Lumbar disc herniation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Understood. Mm. Okay. So moving on. So uh, neurological examination. Uh, okay. We do not really expect much from this lah. But uh, however, patient actually has reduced power over the right side of the uh, legs. Uh, yeah. Global reduction. So MRC grade four on the right side. So doctor, what do you think? Is it, can it be probably because of the pain that's so why he has reduced? Yeah, so you have to ask the patient. When it is uh, globally all four, this mm. is most likely due to pain. Mm. Yeah, then you must ask the patient when you examine the, the, the power, you feel that the power is weaker, they ask the patient, is it because of pain? You see the face, facial grimaces, if the face, is the patient in pain or not? Yeah, so you should uh, check on that. Most of the time, when it's all four, it could be due to pain. Okay, but understood. very rarely is that um, even though patient has pain, right? The EHL and the ankle uh, dorsiflexion shouldn't be grade four. Mm. Unless patient has got a local pathology there. I yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. The hip and the knee can be grade four. But the ankle and the uh, EHL, uh, very rarely. Because same result is from the hip lah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, moving on. Okay, so hip examination. So trendelenburg test was negative. So there was no increased form of ten, uh, erythema noted. So um, as we know, the hip joint is very deep lah. So we do not really expect that we can actually palpate for the temperature. Uh, palpation, no bony tenderness. Uh, range of motion. There was actually reduced hip flexion lah. So hip flexion was only 0 plus to 75 degrees. Internal rotation, external rotation, abduction, adduction, full. However, um, patient actually have pain upon all hip movement. Lah. So from this, we can actually um, conclude that patient has an arthritic kind of pain at the hip joint. Am I right, doctor? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So moving on. So provisional and differential. Okay. So she can uh, just ask you. Lah, since we've already been talking about all the signs, symptoms, and uh, we have really done the physical examination, so um, what do you think about this case? Yeah, it seems like we are moving towards a hip pathology direction, right? Yeah. So most probably it's a, maybe a hip OA, la, yeah, because of the mechanical nature of the pain. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Doctor, is there anything specific that we need to consider in this case? Uh, yeah, so again, uh, my provisional will be hip osteoarthritis of the right hip. Uh, number two, it can still be from the spine, right? So um, 
uh, but um, it's not so clear cut like you know we can get the clinical presentation or oh, this is uh, L3, this is L5 or what. Uh, probably it is just uh, the gen uh, lumbar, uh, uh, degenerative lumbar uh, disease, okay, causing a muscular pain and all that, right? So it can still be from the spine. And uh, the knee, unlikely, unless you know when you do a physical examination of the knee, uh, there's pain as well, right? So knee is a bit unlikely. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Because bear in mind is that when you have a lateral pain, uh, lateral thigh pain, it could be iliotibial uh, tract syndrome. Okay, mm. if the knee uh, TKR uh, uh, is done and there's an irritation to the uh, ITB band, if the knee, uh, if the TKR is too tight, okay, uh, it can irritate the uh, iliotibial band. So patient may have ITB band syndrome. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it can be still a diagnosis, uh, pro, uh, differential diagnosis. Okay, all right. So, okay, moving on. So what investigations that we want to do? So um, in this case, so since we are already talking about, uh, we are more, we are looking towards uh, knee pathology. Other differentials include spine as well as the, oh, sorry, uh, hip, the main one is hip pathology, sorry. Uh, spine as well as knee. So, of course, um, the initial one will be uh, radiograph. Lah. Other than doing a radiograph, um, she can, what, what other things that you might want to do? We're talking about heat radiograph here, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, heat radiograph. I think if we want to look for osteoarthritis changes, I think it's heat radiograph. Lah. But just to rule out any um, uh, spinal pathology, so maybe a... Uh, uh, lumbosacral x-ray, uh, plain radiograph of the lumbosacral region, uh, lumbosacral spine will also be warranted, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, doctor, any other investigation that we need to think of? Or are, are those the initial ones that we need to yeah, do? Yeah, so your investigation should always, um, uh, uh, you should do your investigation to rule out your different shows. Okay, it should always mm -hmm. based on your history and physical examination. <laughs> So if my differential is uh, osteoarthritis of the hip, then I will do a, a hip uh, x-ray, both AP and lateral of the right hip, and also the uh, pelvic AP, okay, mm -hmm. if possible standing, uh, to see the uh, uh, whether there's any arthritic changes of the hip. Uh, number two, I will do a lumbosacral uh, plane radiographs, both AP and, and, and lateral. And since there's a TKI done before, I will also uh, order a right knee uh, uh, x-ray, AP and lateral on standing. Mm. Okay. Doctor, what about for like, just now you mentioned iliotibial band syndrome. Is there a specific investigation that we can do? Since uh, there is no investigation. Uh. So it's, uh, you can, you can uh, check, a phys you can uh, check, um, uh, exam you can examine the patient, all right? Uh, whether the iliotibial band is uh, tight or not, whether there's any pain or not. Yeah, but mm. I, as far as I know, there is no uh, objective for investigation. Okay, all right. Moving on. So, uh, firstly, we'll look at the lumbosacral brain radiograph. Lah. Okay, so from here, you can see there's a lot of degenerative changes. Lah. Um, there's osteophytes, um, there's also reduced joint space. Lah. But, however, this um, for this patient, um, the history is very suggestive of uh, he has been doing a lot of heavy, um, a lot of uh, heavy lifting la, in his life. So probably it's uh, it's very much expected in this case. Am I right, doctor? Mm. Yes. Yeah. So uh, without any neurological deficits, uh, we may not proceed with any further uh, management in this case. Uh, again, again, depends on your, uh, this patient, uh, whether to order MRI or not, I have to examine in, uh, I have to uh, club uh, uh, the patient uh, myself. Mm. So I have to ask whether, uh, what is the uh, pressing issue for this patient, whether it's from the hip or it's from the spine. Mm. Yeah, because one MRI is in the PPM side is 600, in the private <laughs> side is 800 or probably 1000. So it's uh, quite expensive. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, okay. Okay. So from here, you can see um, the vacuum disc phenomenon. So basically, there's actually a um, narrowing, la, narrowing a lot of multiple levels narrowing or still fights or so. La. 
So pathological diagnosis, probably this is a uh, uh, chronic degenerative changes. Lah. Okay, next. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, uh, just uh, go back to the uh, previous slide. Yeah, uh, I have okay. something to add on. Okay. Uh, the vacuum sign in the DISA, uh, uh, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a name for it. Uh, Nutson sign, K-N-U-D-S-O-N, Nutson sign, a vacuum disc phenomenon, uh, like you mentioned. Yeah. Oh, so okay, it, okay. It, it, it just means that it's a degenerative cause. Okay. Yeah, lack right. of uh, water uh, filled with air. Mm. Okay. It's a degenerative cause. Okay, okay. All right. Chicken, you wanted to say something? Oh, yeah, actually, I just want to ask why is there a vacuum this? Uh, what does it mean and all that? But I think Doctor also mentioned already just now, like, yeah, because it's got some air inside, it's degenerative causes, right? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay, moving on. So radiograph. So now we're looking at the right hip plane radiograph. Lah. So what can we see here? So can you try? Just give a bit of explanation. Yeah, so I think um, uh, if we're looking for OA, I think uh, we want to look at the classical OA signs. Uh, so it's a uh, uh, loss of joint space, knee osteophytes, uh, subchondrosis and uh, Subarticular sclerosis. So from here, right? Uh, I don't see any narrowing of joint space. I think there's no narrowing of joint space, but ideally I would want to compare with the other side. Unfortunately, in this patient, he doesn't really have a standing uh, AP X-ray. Uh, he doesn't have a standing X-ray that we can compare both sides. So the so far he only has this one X-ray of the right side. So from here, I can see that maybe there's no narrowing of joint space. Okay. Uh, Osteophytes, I don't think there's any osteophytes also. Is there? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe as this is a maybe we can call this a subchondrosis also. Yeah, maybe, mm. maybe. Yeah. Okay, all right. So uh, moving on. Okay, so now it's, it's all the findings are here. So from here we can see uh, there's not much changes um, besides the sclerosis that uh she can actually mention uh subchondrosis uh subchondrosis sclerosis probably this uh this layer here probably is the sclerosis yeah otherwise it's normal uh, uh rather normal plain radiograph okay all right moving on okay treatment okay <laughs> all right so the treatment okay since we are on the topic of uh talking about spine. La. So uh, we already talked about uh, myelopathy. So the other common one is radiculopathy. La. Okay, so we just talked roughly about the treatment for radiculopathy. So doctor, as far as I know, radiculopathy, usually the treatment is only um, conservative. Am I right? Uh, no, it depends on the uh, um, patient's condition. So you can either offer conservative treatment or surgery. So it can be both. La. Oh, okay, okay. Mm. So, so the indications of surgery, is it um, similar to the ones that uh, was mentioned earlier? For example, patient has severe neurological deficits or severely progressive um, neurological deficits, all those? Yeah, so mainly it's for pain. Uh. In lumbar okay. spinal stenosis, uh, mainly it's for pain. Uh, mm. Patient with neurological deficit as well. Yeah, okay, both. Okay. Yeah, and of okay. course, if you have caudal equina syndrome, then uh, it's an uh, emergency. La. Okay, okay. All right. So, yeah. So that's about it. We just, we'll be just talking about that manage. Uh, we'll be talking about radical pain management la, since it's more spine today. Mm. Okay. So from this final diagnosis, probably um, right hip OA should be the first diagnosis. La. L5 radical pain, mm, probably we need to do Need to ask more questions and determine whether which is the more pressing issue here. Okay. Um, so yeah. So speaking about radiculopathy, I think um, one thing that's important that we need to know about about radiculopathy is the nerve root mismatch and matching, lah. Am I right, doctor? Mm. Also transversing and exiting the root. Maybe doctor can just give a brief explanation about it. Okay. Uh, so um, the difference between the lumbar spine and the cervical spine is that. Uh, the spinal cord ends at L12. So in the lumbar spine, they are traversing the foot because it has to go down and exit the, uh, through the uh, neuroforamen. 
So there is uh, uh, traversing the fruit. Okay, but for cervical spine, uh, there is no traversing the fruit. So the uh, nerve fruit exit uh, just immediately after it comes up from the spinal cord. Okay, so if say for example the problem uh, arise, the question arises here is that when you have uh, this prolapse, okay, so uh, which uh, nerve that it compresses? So for example in the lumbar spine, if you're talking about L4-5 uh, disc uh, prolapse, uh, most commonly is a posterior lateral uh, disc prolapse. So when it is a posterior lateral disc prolapse, it will compress on the traversing nerve root. And in this level, the traversing nerve root is L5. Okay, so in L4-5 disc prolapse, the the, the, the nerve root which is being compressed is the traversing nerve root L5. Traversing L5. Okay. Whereas in the cervical spine, if you have C4-5 uh, disc prolapse, uh, not shown here. Okay, then we move on. Uh, C5-6 disc prolapse. Oh, you see, uh, okay. Uh, C, uh, never mind, uh, let's follow your example. C6-7 disc prolapse, okay. All right, it compresses the exiting nerve root, which is C7. Because the nerve root uh, from the uh, cervical spine, all right, it exit one level above the pedicle. It exit above the pedicle, not one level, sorry, it exit above the pedicle. So if in C67, the nerve root that is being, that the nerve root that comes up from C67 uh, is C7. Because the nerve root comes out above the pedicle. You get what I mean? So like say for example, you have C12, the nerve root that comes out is C2. Alright? Because the corresponding level nerve root comes out, it comes out from the neural foramen above the pedicle, not below the pedicle. In the rest of the body, yes, it belongs the pedicle. It, uh, it comes up below the pedicle. Because cervical has got eight nerve roots, but only seven vertebra. All right, so I have to give way for the C8. Okay. All right, so C1 to 7 comes up above the pedicle, C8 below the C7 pedicle. All right, then T1 below the T1 pedicle. All right, mm -hmm. so in acute disc prolapse of the cervicals in the cervical spine, in C6, 7, the nerve root being compressed is the exiting C7. Okay, so what is the difference? The number is the same. The numbering is the same. L4-5, L5 nerve root. C4-5, C5 nerve root. The only difference is the uh, terminology. L4-5, L5 traversing nerve root. C4-5, C5 exiting nerve root. All right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I think um, Doctor actually mentioned a very important point. La. Like, uh, it's something that we all medical students will get confused of, but in the end of the day, we we'll always just memorize. It's, uh, it will always affect the lower number. So like L4, L5 is always the L5. Uh, C6, C7 is always the C7. However, like as what Doctor said, for the lumbar, it, um, the it prolapse is usually at the posterior lateral, so it will affect the transverse signal fluid. And um, for cervical region, it usually affects the cervical, uh, affects the exiting nerve root, sorry. Okay, so doctor, just want to ask a bit more about like correlation to the symptoms. La. Like patient usually like, uh, as what we usually read from textbook, they always say listing, listing due to uh, the compression of the nerve root. So there's ipsilateral and contralateral listing. So maybe doctor can um, give a rough explanation about these two. Yeah, uh, it is uh, described very well in Apley. Mm. So you can open up your Abley book. Uh, there's one photo on the, uh, I think, left-hand side. There's one photo. So uh, listing is uh, described in uh, acute disc prolapse, all right, in the lumbar region. So say, for example, if you have uh, a shoulder disc prolapse, okay, the patient will list to the contralateral yeah, side true. because yeah. the patient wants to move away the nerve root wants to move away from the <clears throat> from the disc, okay. But if there's an axilla disc herniation, the patient will move will list towards uh, ipsilateral listing, 
Okay, because mm -hmm. when you if, when you list towards the uh, this prolapse, all right, then it opens up the space. The nerve root is being uh, it, it, the nerve root is uh, moved away from the uh, this condition. Mm. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, I think that's about it. Um, okay, so next uh, slide. Uh, can you help me to move to the next slide? <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think we actually talked about this just now. Lah. Doctor actually mentioned the eight clinical diagnosis of spine. Okay, just a quick recap here. Next, uh, okay, so looks like we have already come to the end of our session today. So um, before we end it, uh, anyone has any questions, can either just um, raise your hand and uh, and you can unmute your mic or you can also put it down in the chat box. Yeah. Otherwise, um, Chicken, do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask? So apparently, uh, the, the, there's no questions in the chat box so far. Yeah. All right. OK, just that. Uh, uh, one last thing, I think the I think the only I think one last important thing maybe uh, we would like to know. Oh, yeah, actually, there's a question here uh, by Christine Audrey. Hi, doctor. Can I ask when do we order for trans pedicular biopsy? I think this is uh, in regards to the first case. Right? Yeah, trans pedicular biopsy. Uh, when you want to get a culture. Lah. So pedic uh, biopsy of the spine, uh, you want to get a culture. Say, for example, infection, you want to get a culture. Uh, number two, if it is tumor. So if there is a, a presence of spine metastasis, but the tumor is unknown, the primary tumor is unknown, then you can order a uh, biopsy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, like uh, so uh, yeah, just I was saying just now, uh, um, uh, in regards to uh, another, I think a common question that a lot of uh, uh, doctors ask is that uh, what is the difference between mechanical pain and inflammatory pain? Okay, so in general, uh, in general, the back pain can be divided into mechanical and non-mechanical. The non-mechanical basically is the organic back pain. All right, so mechanical can be further divided into instability and uh, without instability, all right. Mechanical means that pain upon movement. If there's no movement, no pain. Uh, pain upon movement. Instability means that pain upon physiological movement. It's a more severe type of pain. So, uh, 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 instability pain like you know you have a fracture, you have infection or tumor. Patient cannot get up from sitting position because patient has a lot of pain. All right. The pain can be more severe that the patient cannot turn to the side, okay? For organic back pain, I would say that inflammatory back pain is also a subset of organic back pain. So it can be inflammatory, it can be tumor, it can be infection, right? This patient, they have pain even though without movement and the pain is more severe at rest or at night. Yeah. All right, okay, thank you, doctor. OK, so I think uh, we need to know the concept of mechanical pain, uh, instability, instability pain and also inflammatory pain. That's I think, uh, yeah, they, a lot of people say that a lot of doctors ask this question. All right, uh, going back to the transpedicular biopsy, uh, doctor, uh, does it mean that we indicate it for all spine infection cases? Uh, not really. So normally it depends on the uh, uh, whether that we can say for example, if you're talking about infection, uh, right? If you're talking about about infection, if you're able to get the culture from other source, okay, reliable source, then yes, you can treat the spine infection based on that reliable uh, culture. Uh, this means, like for example, you have a blood culture, all right, uh, then you can treat the spine infection based on the blood culture. Uh, we do not uh, use urine culture because urine can be you know, uh, it can be polymicrobial. Uh, it's not uh, very uh, reliable. Okay, All right. So blood culture, yes. Our patient has been diagnosed with some sort of uh, infection, 
and now present with spine infection within the same uh, presentation, then yes, we can use that uh, culture result uh, to treat the spine infection. Sorry, doctor, transpedicular biopsy is, uh, we do it through open surgery or we do it like minimally invasive, like CT guided, all those? Yeah, so uh, transpedicular biopsy can be uh, done in both ways. One is fluoroscopic guidance, another one is CT guidance. So it's uh, not open surgery. You just make a skin neck and put a troca in and through the pedicle and towards the uh, pathological site. Yeah, so it can be either fluoroscopic or CT guided. So basically, because it's a bit more invasive, so that's why we uh, try to find other more reliable, uh, other more less invasive methods to get our culture first, uh, like the blood and all that. Yeah, if possible, yes. Yeah. But if in, uh, it's not very, it's not invasive lah, because um, it's quite safe. It's just that uh, there's still a risk lah, you know, yeah, injuring the spinal cord or other organs. All right, thank you, doctor. Uh, I hope uh, that answers the question. Anyways, uh, anybody else has uh, any other questions? If not, uh, I think uh, this would be the end of the session. Lah. So um, uh, yeah, we uh, I know we overshot uh, by quite some time because uh, we thought we would end at 9.30, but now it's already 10. But mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, thank you so much to everyone uh, for coming and joining us on this uh, Sunday night. Uh, we hope that uh, this session is actually uh, quite useful for everyone. All right, uh, especially those who uh, haven't entered orthopedics yet. Hopefully this can be an uh, uh, eye opener. And for those who have entered orthopedics rotation and you did join us for today, hopefully this can be a good refresher for you guys as well. So uh, thank you so much everyone for coming. All right, uh, but before you go off, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so it would be great if you can fill up the feedback form because we also want to improve the future case by case sessions by uh, the medical society. So it'd be great if everyone can fill up the feedback form that is already in the chat room. Yeah, uh, the chat box. Yeah, so, uh, Mr. Leong Vanjet, uh, our host for today, actually uh, did send the feedback form inside the chat chat box. So everyone can just click on the link and fill up the feedback to help us improve on further sessions. Uh, and with that, uh, since there are no more other questions, uh, Aaron, uh, I think we can end the session for today, right? Yeah, I think we should end it since okay. we already always shut for some time. Okay. <laughs> All right, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chung, for coming. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, okay, Dr. Chung, you. for coming. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, good night and have a good, uh, good week ahead. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Hope you learned something today. Bye.